Thank you very much, Zeynep. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you, Mike, for this wonderful introduction to all the technologies. So um, I will, um, OK, sorry. This one, maybe. No? OK. I have no commercial disclosures. So, so I work at the clinical genetics department, and we are a uh, genetic diagnostic laboratory, one of six uh, regional centers for genetic diagnostics here in Sweden. We also have a genetic counseling unit, and, and what the work we do in diagnostics is really tightly coupled to research at the Karolinska Institute, where we also try to sort of push method development and how can we improve diagnostics in general. And, and when it comes to chromosome elaborations, we do about 2,000 analyses each year, both from children with um, um, different types of, I don't know how I, I don't know how I use the pointer. Uh, children with intellectual disability or syndromes or um, uh, yeah, autism. And we have prenatal samples with malformations. And we have cancer samples, both leukemia samples and solid tumors. And I'm going to give you today a, a short introduction into what we're working and the methods we're using. And then, like, uh, instead of these massive numbers of samples that Mike tells us about, I will give you individual cases where we really try to use short and length and long read sequencing technology to understand the rearrangements and, and both how they occurred but also how they cause disease. So um, the cytogenetic tests we currently use in the clinic, karyotyping, fish, and microarrays, uh, obviously have limitations. They have limitations in resolution, they have limitations in the ability to assess copy number, and the inability to assess location of the different DNA segments. And um, what we've been asking for a couple of years now is really, can whole genome sequencing be used to detect chromosomal rearrangements as a sort of clinical first tier test? Um, and. Um, when you are a cytogeneticist, you like to look at chromosomes. And I don't know if all of you in here are from the bioinformatics side or from the cytogenetic side, but we have this terminology of chromosomal rearrangement when it comes from you can have a deletion that's visible by karyotyping uh, on the far left here. You can have then a ring chromosome that obviously also often includes deletions. You can have these reciprocal deletions, duplications regions that we know now are caused by non-allelic homologous combination between repeats. And then we have the translocations, the reciprocal, and we have the uh, Robertsonian, as well as the peri- and paracentric inversions. But really, I think from a clinical point of view, what is interesting to us is, is this a balanced rearrangement? Is this a person with a balanced translocation who's at risk of having imbalances in, gam in the gametes? Is their copy number loss? Is their copy number gain of important disease genes? Is this a complex rearrangement with multiple pieces, you know, that, that are involved? And do we, can we really get the full picture from this analysis that we have made? And then with the sort of introduction of other types of methods to look at chromosomal variation, the term structural variance that Mike also mentioned a lot uh, was sort of introduced for the variants that were below the resolution of karyotyping. And for quite some time, we talked about variants larger than 1 kb, but I think this is really arbitrary. Mike said 50 kb. Maybe we'll end up with sort of a definition where you, if you have something that's within a single short read, it's an indole, but if it's beyond that, it's a structural variant. This is sort of how I feel about, think about it. But really, for, also for these structural variants, it's the same type of important questions we ask in the clinic. Is it balanced? Is there a disrupted gene? Is there copy number loss or gain, or is it more complex? So um, uh, I'm just going to show this really quickly, but um, there's a lot of reviews out there about how do structural variants actually cause disease. And it all comes down to what is the number of functional gene copies um, uh, in the end, I would say. If you have a CNV that affects a single gene and it's deleted, you have lost, you have one functional copy. And if it's duplicated, you have three functional copies. But you can really be, be a little bit in between. So you can have a partial deletion, and if the transcript is not uh, degraded, that could actually be a gain-of-function mutation. 
you can have a partial duplication that causes a loss of function and a functional copy of one. And then you have the contiguous gene syndromes where you can have multiple important uh, copy uh, number variable genes within the region that are susceptible to this gene dose change and will give a combinatory effect on the phenotype. And then we have a number of beautiful talks yesterday about the, the TADs and the long range effects and how if you move promoters and enhancers so they affect new genes or they cease to affect the old gene, that can also cause a phenotype. And I think that for the balanced rearrangements, we can really think a little bit in the same way. So you can have a gene disruption or a fusion gene created. Rarely, and we've seen that in germline, but I'm sure there are examples out there, and it's often observed in cancer. And then we have the regulatory effects. And really to know what are the genes that are affected by the structural variant, you need to have the breakpoints at high resolution. So, if we have the breakpoints located, we can also do somewhat of a rough classification of the structural variants, and, and these are CNVs, but the same sort of applies to balanced rearrangements. You can have the recurrent rearrangements that happen de novo in unrelated individuals, and there the breakpoints cluster in these repeat elements, the, the LCRs, but also it's now been shown that even shorter repeats down to ALU can actually mediate these type of events. And then you have the non-recurrent events. We have individuals with a similar phenotype that have overlapping structural variants, and in the middle you often have a small region of overlap or, uh, where you have the important disease-causing genes. And then you can have this C group where you have somewhat of a grouping of the breakpoints in architectural elements that are important for rearrangement formation. And, and to really understand what is the mechanism of underlying this rearrangement formation, you need to get all the way down to the breakpoints at the nucleotide level. And I think that the whole genome sequencing, I mean, all the different variants we're talking about today has been absolutely marvelous at doing this. If you come from the area before whole genome sequencing where we, we had to do, you know, like multiple PCRs and, and southern blot and fish experiments to find the breakpoints of, of a single case. And, and if we just look really quickly at this, there are a number of, of sort of mechanisms in the cell that can, can patch together double-stranded breaks, um, like the non oligous end joining that has been the most common mechanism for uh, reciprocal translocations, but sometimes you can also see that these are replicative events that are uh, mediated uh, through uh, the FOSTIS and MBIR mechanism. And then you have the non oligous recombination where the... Um, the breakpoints cluster in these large repeat segments. But you also, on the, on the left, on the bottom side, since I, I don't get the uh, here, you have these stretches of microhomology, which is a few nucleotides that are identical between the two parental chromosomes in this case. So we really don't know where this originates from. And this is, is important both in non-homologous end joining and in the replicated mechanisms. So working... Um, with these cases with structural variants, we're really trying to answer um, what are the mechanisms that are causing the SV formation and also how does this SV cause the phenotype to happen in the patient. And um, then moving into short read sequencing, and I'll go through this quite quickly because Mike really to somewhat covered it, but we did in the short read VGS data, we detect the events through discordant read pairs and the split reads. And then we really use the read orientation and the coverage to classify variants. And I think variant classification is still challenging from short read data, but if you like do a manual interpretation, you're, you're, you're often good, but you rarely get the complete picture just from the colors. Um, if you have questions about the pipelines and colors that we developed, you should talk to Jasper and just come up to me and I'll, I'll introduce you to him. Um, so this is just a zoom in in the IGV browser of a deletion, and here you can see uh, that you have a 30x coverage at the end of the deletion, and here in the middle you have, it drops to 15x, so you have like a drop in read depth. If you zoom in on the end, you see these highlighted discordant reads where the mate that is supposed to be within roughly 400 base pairs is too far away. And then if you zoom in on these reads, you can see a number of split reads where you have nice mapping. This is a common SNV here. And here you see that this part of these reads don't belong here. It's on the other end of the deletion. 
So using the short read technology, we've actually had quite a lot of success stories, and, and both from our lab and obviously from around the world studying structural variants. Balanced structural variants can pinpoint human disease genes. So these are just two examples from the past couple of years with the CTN and D2 gene on top that was disrupted by translocation breakpoint in a mother and daughter with a dyslexia type of phenotype. And on the bottom, the TRIP12 gene that was disrupted by translocation breakpoint. And then we went together in a consortium and found additional patients. And it was actually reported out as a, as a new intellectual disability gene. But even more importantly, this girl here in the, in the red circle was able to get a diagnosis at the gene level. We could give the parents some feedback about what is expected, what is this pathway, why did this happen? Um, so these balanced structural variants also represent missing heritability. It's this type of, of annoying you know, cases where we know that it must be this pathway or this gene, but we're just not finding the variant. And this is an example of a four-generation Finnish family with pseudo-hypoparathyroidism type 1b, where they knew from linkage analysis and methylation studies that it should be the GNOS gene, but they just couldn't find the variant. And we performed whole genome sequencing, and we found an inversion of 1.8 megabases with the breakpoints in unique sequence. So here you can see this map, two ends of the, uh, of the, um, of the inversion with the two breakpoints, and you have the turquoise reads mapping to each other here and the blue reads mapping to each other here. And actually here, uh, we are right between exon 1 and 2 in the GNOS gene. So this is the loss of function mutation uh, explaining the phenotype in this case. So, so with that, you know, I just want to conclude my, my short read part, that short read sequencing really has high accuracy, sensitivity, and precision in samples with known structural variants. It's, We've done about 400 plus individuals with uh, various sort of structural variants with short read VGS. Of a, this graph here is of about 100 CNVs, and we have a 100% detection rate there for clinically relevant CNVs, uh, going from 500 base pairs to 155 megabases. And Daniel Nielsen has a poster where he talks about this, and also about a prospective study we did on 100 cases referred to our clinic for a race CGH. Um, at the Karolinska Genomic Medicine Center, we just processed our 5,000 sample, so we're quite happy about that. And we, the first 1,000 were uh, exomes, but then from spring 2015, when we got the um, X10 system, we moved to VGS, so about 4,000 clinical VGS. And that is extremely useful when it comes to the databases for filtering out the rare variants. And I think that at this point, the centers that have big internal databases can make much more use of the short read data than centers who hasn't processed that many samples. And I think the Gnoma database and others like that will be really helpful for us in the clinic when we want to start calling structural variants uh, on patients from BGS data. We are actually doing this since a year and a half back. We are calling structural variants in our monogenic gene panels and, and, and reporting them back to patients, obviously still, still validating them. Uh, there are some limitations of the short read SV analysis, uh, and I think Mike touched upon that. The balanced rearrangements are a big problem when the uh, breakpoints are located in repetitive regions. This is just the numbers from our samples on translocations and inversions, but, but Mike's group has published more, and I think most of us are, the numbers are the same. We're between 70 to 90 percent of them are getting captured with a short read, and that has to do with where the breakpoints are located. Um, we also really, I think, want to position the duplicates. We want to know where are they in the genome, and that's not always possible with short read sequencing. Um, we want to face. So we want to face the SV and the SNVs. We want to find the compound heterozygotes, and we want to face the complex rearrangements. And I'm going to talk a lot about this these complex cases coming up now. Um, so the complementary VGS technologies we used are on this slide. Um, this is a, not a complete list of the VGS technologies that are out there, but we did a lot of linked read sequencing with the 10X genomics protocol where you barcode your DNA before fragmentation, and then after regular short read sequencing, you can sort of reassemble these long um, molecules. Um, the iris optical mapping, you sort of 
you nick your DNA and, and you mark it for fluorophores and you get this sort of a genome-wide barcodes. And to me, it's like really, really, really long chromosomes. So I like it a lot. Um, however, you do not have nucleotide resolution here and your resolution will depend on how many of these barcodes you have in a specific region. And then we, we just recently sent a few samples for Oxford nanopore sequencing, which is more of a, a true single you know, molecule sequencing where you, Mark really explained that really well, how you get this current change depending on what base you have. And, and here you can get single molecules up to about one megabase, but what they told me is that you have to share your DNA to about 20 KB fragments if you want a lot of output from your experiment. So, so now I'm gonna give you just a few examples of how we've been using these technologies to kind of understand more about our, our cases and, and the underlying biology. Um, so one study uh, that will be presented more in detail uh, tomorrow by Maria is uh, on cytogenetically visible inversions. And interestingly enough, you know, these, these are gross chromosomal rearrangements that are in general considered balanced. But when we sequence them, we find that we do have cases that are in fact balanced. Um, with the breakpoints in unique sequence, like the ones you see here on the left, while we also have those who have more of a complex pattern involving also, uh, for instance, duplications. Um, and this is just one family that I'll give us an example where they had a complex inversion on chromosome X, and it was first ascertained through the proband, a, a young boy who died who had a recombinant chromosome. And as you can see, this same recombinant chromosome has actually arisen twice independently uh, in this uh, free generation pedigree. So we performed um, uh, a copy number uh, RACGH on all of the cases here, and you can see that uh, case number uh, two one and three one they have the same recombinant chromosome with a deletion of fragment A and a duplication of fragment E. However, as you see, even the carriers of the sort of normal INVX also have duplications on P and Q of 350KB and 58KB. And we think this is actually really interesting. And we wanted to know then, are these duplications actually present on the same molecule as the inversion? Uh, so for this, we performed them um, at 10x linked read VGS. And we were then able to face the SNVs that were informative across the um, 10x molecules, and you can see here that for this, this particular SNV, we have 66% wild type and 33% SNV, showing that it's actually the duplicated, uh, duplication is present on the inverted haplotype. So, so this really enabled us to understand a little bit more about how did this duplication inversion arise in the first place, and you actually have a two-step process where you first have the duplication of segment B and D, and then you have the inversion of segment B, C, D. And as for the recombinant chromosomes, uh, after formation of an inversion loop, we have a crossover in the C segment. That is a really big segment, right? It's almost all of the X chromosome, so that is probably the reason this has happened twice in, in three generations. Um, and then this um, actual recombinant that we're seeing is, is the one here highlighted in, in with a red frame. Uh, so, so, so this was really like a, a complex rearrangement, even though at first we thought it would be a balanced rearrangement. Uh, sometimes you can, from the cytogenetics and, and a race, already suspect that there's something complex going on here. You can have a array images where you have mixtures of deletions and duplications clustering on the same chromosome, or you can have multiple chromosomes involved, you know, through karyotyping. And, and there have been a, a number of, of phenomena, I would say, described in the literature, mainly sort of coming from the cancer field, but we're starting now, as, as Mike Mar said, also observing them in germline. So, so I would say that... Um, that the, the chromatripsis, which is like the shattering and stitching together, where you can have loss of fragments and, and you can see inversions, but you rarely see gains. 
Chromanus synthesis is really the extra synthesis of new DNA segments where you have several template switchings and you get duplications and triplications and sometimes losses and inversions. And this is primed by microhomology. And then you have the, the, the new player in the field, I guess, chromoplexy, which is um, then, uh, I couldn't find a nice image, but I mean, it's really like linked translocations of multiple chromosomes that we have to think about some more. So, so some of these cases that I'll show you have been studied for quite some time. This is a weird chromosome 21. You can see up the karyotype up on the left side, you see this little tiny chromosome. And, and we published back in 2010 a sort of best guess from molecular cytogenetics with uh, 16 breakpoints, four deletions, and four duplications. And then with short read sequencing, we could see that there were actually 25 breakpoints at four deletions and nine duplications. And, and it's really like, if you look at the circus plot, it really goes all over chromosome 21. And, and back and forth. I, I won't read the VGS karyotype, I guess. We don't really have time for that. So, so here you can just see how we're trying to puzzle the chromosome together with the, um, the P arm uh, up here and the Q arm down here. And you can see how you can like follow the links and get the different the segments uh, sort of and the way they are, are arranged. However, you do still have these fragments that don't connect to the others. Um, and we tried to sort of understand more about these unmappable breakpoints using both linked read and mate pairs with 2KB and 20KB inserts as well as BioNano, but we were not really able to, to, to like puzzle them in with the others. And, and these other sort of some of these other parts are not in the human genome. Some of them are in these unmappable contexts that are part of the human genome but haven't been positioned yet. We tried with both HG19 and HG38, but I mean, so hopefully with a better reference, we might be able to get this chromosome finally, you know, sort of fully solved. But at this point, this is where we're, where we're at. Um, the breakpoints and, and the rearrangement looks like it's chromanosynthesis. We have deletions and duplications, we see inverted fragments, and we see microhomology. Um, so the next case I wanted to show you is a patient from CNEP. So it's patient 00, and they actually performed mate pair sequencing in Copenhagen, and, and we then, um, and they were able to find seven deletions and five inversions on chromosome seven. However, if you, if you look over, over here um, on the A, A fragment, there is no link at the end of this deletion to the rest of the rearrangement. And you can see here why. The mate pair data, there is really poor coverage and there is just a few poorly mapped reads in this, this particular region. Um, while we, when, and when we did then the linked read sequencing, we were actually able to, to, to find this missing link and puzzle the chromosome together completely. And, and, um, but what you can see here is that the, the linked read, even though it could give us this link because we knew exactly where it was, it's still quite messy, you know. It's, it's not easy to, to, to just straight out from this without knowing where to look to, to just characterize the chromosomal rearrangement. So, so it's not really ready for um, sort of as a first tier test yet. But to follow up, it, it's really great. Um, so now I'm going to tell you about my, my sort of favorite patient. That was the first paper I published back in 2008. I performed more than 100 fish analysis on this case. I did a back array, you can see here, um, with a 0.5 megabase deletion. And she's actually really, I would say, mildly affected with hypotonia. She has an ectopic left kidney, some uh, vision and hearing problems, and, and then a psych mild psychomotor delay. And we found with this molecular cytogenetic analysis that there were 14 breakpoints and then this one small deletion. So, so over the years, we performed a number of different short read libraries. We did optical mapping and, and linked read VGS in this case. And I'll just show you like a little bit of what the data looked like. And, and we actually here, we have a final solution. 
So, so this is just a screenshot showing that even though the PCR-free VGS works really well, in many cases here you see one of these difficult regions where you have on the left side these really poorly mapped reads in a repetitive region. And here, since we had all the fish mapping, we knew that there is a breakpoint here, we just can't find it. The, um, um, the optical mapping could find 20 out of the 26 junctions that were there. So it was really good at large rearrangements in repetitive regions, but obviously it failed to detect smaller fragments and some of the really small complex deletions we had. It was nice because it confirmed some of the breakpoints and the JSON reads from the short read sequencing. So I think that is really an added value when you have different types of technology uh, that you can validate that what you're seeing is actually seems to be true. Uh, in this case, the linked read VGS uh, was, you know, outperformed the others because we found all the 26 junctions. We needed to use the, the, the two callers that we used, that we got from the company, was called Long Ranger and Supernova, where Long Ranger really assembles the, the barcodes and create these long molecules and then maps them back to the reference. And, and in that way, we found 23 junctions, while the Supernova, that the Novo assembles these molecules, was able to find 15 junctions, but three of them were not found by Long Ranger. So, so altogether, we found all of the junctions that, that were sort of present. Um, and these images are just from the long range of uh, software on top where you can see this little fiery thing is then the, the, bar, the number of barcodes in that region and how then the same barcode is on an, in another place. And below you can see the supernova assembled calls in RDV. Uh, so, here is just a summary slide of these two junctions that we couldn't find by short reads. So the short read sequencing in the middle. On top you have the link reads that, um, context that link together in IGV and on the bottom you see the nanopore and, and the fish image from breakpoint one. And, um, and when we sort of tried to then draw out this derivative chromosome, we ran out of letters in the alphabet, so we had to use both capital and small letters. And <laughs> we have, you know, it really looked like homotropsis. We have no gains, we have only deletions and inversions, no microhomology. But it is quite interesting that there's actually a gap. You can see here, the lines here are like how segments are going from the P-arm to the Q-arm and back to the P-arm and back to the Q-arm. And, and really the largest sort of distance is 171 megabases. So chromotrypsis is usually you have the breakpoints clustering in really distinct regions. So it's hard to say is this sort of, I'm thinking maybe this like is a haltered formation of a ring chromosome. How did these P and Q arm come this close together in the first place? So it's sort of solved, but I'm, I'm not completely, I need to think about this some more still. Uh, so the final case I'm going to talk about is, is not published yet. It's a complex translocation involving six chromosomes. I'll give you just a few seconds to look at the chromosomes. I, I think we highlighted them for you, so it's not that tricky. Um, but actually, what it looks like is that there are two separate events going on here. So these are, this is a de novo rearrangement, and um, uh, it seems like there's a 7-Eleven translocation, and then there's a complex four-way event between the other chromosomes. Uh, and we did regular short read Illumina VGS and found that they are actually separate events. So, um, so that was nice. Uh, however, there seems to be really, really, really complicated and, um, and, and okay, how do we sort of map this all together? Um, the 7-Eleven translocation, we did identify all the breakpoints from the Illumina short read. There were, so it was the simpler of the complex rearrangements. There were only five breakpoints. And um, we can, uh, we, there were two inverted segments on chromosome 11, and the part from chromosome 7 that was translated was actually split into two segments. And when we did linked read on this case, we could actually reconstruct the entire rearrangement from the linked read phase blocks. So, so Jasper Eisfeld, my student, he wrote a script that sort of used the, the if you have one junction in a phase block, you can then just use the script to detect all the other breakpoints in the same phase block and link in with interconnecting phase blocks. So that was actually quite cool that we could sort of draw the rearrangement from the phase blocks. Um, for the more 
for the more complex then four-way translocation, we, we started analyzing the Illumina data. And, and this is extremely hard um, work, I would say, uh, where we have to go from one junction, follow the mates to the next junction, follow the mates to the next junction. So here we are, like on the left side, we're at 81 megabase on chromosome 4, then we jump to 88, then we jump to 90, then we jump to chromosome 21, and then we jump to X. So if you make a mistake here, you're going to end up, you know, with a completely wrong solution. You have to sort of start from the beginning. We detected about 110 junctions with the short read sequencing. Uh, to try and kind of understand and, and get a little bit of a stronger signal, we did both, the, we did mate pair sequencing with 2 kb and 20 kb inserts. And, and you see here that the signal does get stronger with the longer insert size, however, we lose resolution. So, so in, in our lab, we actually, you know, we like the short read PCR free libraries because we have a huge database to filter against and we get validation directly from the split read so we know that we are at the true event. So even though we had about like 500 discordant pairs supporting an event in the 20 kb mate pair data, we were still really far from the actual junction and, and, and therefore it was a bit more hard to, to use that, I would say. Um, when it comes to the linked read data, we, we saw pretty much the same as we did with the PCR-free VGS, but we, we do get some additional sort of support from, from the face box and how this is in, interconnected. Uh, this is a figure that you get from the, the Lupus software that the company provides, and you can see here that there are a number of, of brightly colored links between chromosome one and chromosome four, and it almost looks like chromosome 21 has been chopped up into tiny pieces and they are like inserted into chromosome 4. Uh, uh, we also did BioNano for this sample and we detected fewer junctions, about 70, uh, which is really has to do with the sort of where you have your barcodes, but also because we have a very poor BioNano reference. So, so we don't really know the normal from the non-normal. It was also quite hard to, to use this for translocation analysis because the softwares weren't really used for that. We got a lot of help from Bionano Informatics, but we still had to kind of puzzle them very manually together. But here is one molecule that I think just shows how we could use the Bionano technology, where we go from the, the end of the, the, the chromosome 21, and then we move into, um, see if you don't lose my, me here, so we move, here is the end of chromosome 21, and then we have a molecule that's 2.7 megabases that move into an inversion on chromosome 4, then we have a normal region on chromosome 4, and then we move back into an inverted segment on chromosome 21. So here we can really validate multiple junctions in a single molecule, which I think is, is, is kind of neat. Um, when you, when you then compare the short read with the optical mapping, uh, you see that there is a link between chromosome 21 and 19 that is not present in the optical mapping data. We can only find that with short read. And you can see there is one sort of intrachromosomal link on the X chromosome that's only seen by optical mapping and not present in the short read. Uh, so, so after sort of all of this, we're at about 125 breakpoints, and they are really clustering in this 20 megabase region on chromosome 4, a 9 megabase region on chromosome 21, and then we have three breakpoints on 19 and two on X. But we really still couldn't map the derivatives together. We know from, from karyotyping that a lot of sort of genomic information is on the X derivative because that is a very, very large chromosome. So, so then uh, they got a, a Promethean sequencer in Uppsala, so I can't take Lars Pjok at the National Genomics Infrastructure there, and we sent him this sample for uh, Nanopore VGS. And, uh, and this data was, was analyzed yesterday. <laughs> Uh, so I think it's really cool because you can see here how we can really get additional information from the nanopore technology, finding and spanning more breakpoint junctions. So on the bottom you have the, the Illumina data that we weren't really able to understand how it, um, it sort of, um, I don't know, comes together with the other chromosomes and on top you have the nanopore. And, um, and if, you look, um, if you look here, it almost looks like a deletion in the Illumina data, but, but that is, it's just 
sort of an artifact from the complexity in this region. And here you see the nice blue uh, nanopore reads that here dock over to chromosome 21, and this one is actually an inversion on chromosome 4, and in between them we have a 5 base pair deletion. Uh, and here is another region on chromosome 21, and you can see that it's, it's really like a lot of poorly mapped reads, and the, the sort of read coverage is, is quite noisy. But in the nanopore data, we see clearly that there's a heterozygous deletion here, and both of these then um, nanopore reads dock over from chromosome 21 to chromosome 4. So, so, so with this additional kind of technology, we were able to find five additional breakpoints, and, and we're now at 130, uh, and we could then puzzle the derivative chromosomes together. Um, so, um, so then I don't know, you know, we call them by the name of the centromere, but there's not much left of the original chromosomes in this case. Um, we do have two sort of gaps. Um, we know from the linked read sequencing that the sort of these uh, are bridged by the same barcodes, so they are on the same derivative, but there could actually be additional segments in between that we haven't fully been able to understand yet. Um, finally, on, on this case, I, I just wanted to show you what the breakpoints of the two rearrangements look like, because it actually looks like they might have two separate mechanisms. In the 7-Eleven translocation, we see templated insertions and SNVs and indels, and we see microhomology, which really is sort of hallmark features of replication-based mechanisms. Um, well, in the complex four-way translocation, we see these long random insertions, very similar actually to the complex chromosome 21 rearrangement we couldn't fully delineate that I talked about earlier. So, so this seems to be something else going on here completely. Um, so uh, with that, I just want to conclude that puzzling chromosomal rearrangements together is quite challenging, but we do find important information. Short read BGS, I think, works really well, but, but complementary technologies are, are important when we have balanced breakpoints in repetitive regions and when we have multiple structural variants in cis. We need better analytical tools. We need both colors and databases, because um, currently it's very, very manual work puzzling these chromosomes back together. Uh, and the linked and the long read data is, is really noisy and not optimal for, for, for screening. So, um, I think that's something we could really work on. The reference is a limiting factor. I need to, to dock in with the previous speaker there. I mean, if you have a rearrangement uh, that is not on the same, that where the ancestral background is not the same as the reference, you might end up with a completely wrong solution if you use the reference to map it. So, so I think this is a big problem. Um, and uh, with this, I just want to say that there's been a ton of people involved in this work, both from the clinical lab and from the rare diseases group and from our collaborators in Copenhagen and at Baylor and in Uppsala and at SciLife Lab. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>